It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Joe Chuman. Dr. Chuman has been the leader of the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County, New Jersey since 1974, and since 2008 has served as a part-time leader of the New York Society for Ethical Culture here. As an activist, Dr. Truman has worked on behalf of human rights, civil liberties, and in opposition to the death penalty, as well as many other progressive causes. He founded the North, Northern New Jersey Group of Amnesty International and currently serves as president of the Bergen County Sanctuary for Asylum Seekers, founded by the Ethical Culture Society of Bergen County. This coalition of religious and human rights organizations provides services for, for asylum seekers who are released from federal detention. Dr. Chuman teaches human rights at the graduate level at Columbia University and has taught at the United Nations University for Peace in San Jose, uh, San Jose, Costa Rica. Excuse me. He has published numerous articles in the, in the record of Bergen County. He has also had articles published in the New York Times, The Humanist, Free Inquiry, Humanistic Judaism, and other periodicals. He's had articles published on ethical culture and religion in several encyclopedias. Today, Joe will be speaking on To Whom Are Humanists Accountable? Please welcome him. So lovely to be back here, a little bit out of sequence. Usually I speak on the second Sunday, but it, there was a calendar change. So good, thank you so much for that great music. I mean, it was really a special treat. We don't have it very often. Thanks so very much. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers who are here, but I bet you they're outnumbered by the mothers. I just got a sense, right? I don't know, right? Yeah, fathers are probably a dying breed or something. I don't know. But um, it's great to see you all. Uh, just a few announcements. Unfortunately, I have to cancel. I have a monthly discussion group here on the third Tuesdays. Unfortunately, this Tuesday, I have to cancel it uh, because the um, the uh, National Leaders Council, which is our professional association of ethical leaders, is meeting in Tampa, Florida on Tuesday, starting Tuesday afternoon, and I have to get down there, and then that's followed by the American Ethical Union Annual Convention or Assembly. So I'll be in Florida in the summer for five days. Anybody been to Florida in the summer? Uh, it's like walking into it, like walking into a furnace. Um, but anyway, I have to be have to be down there. Um, also, unfortunately, I'm dressed like this. I only dress like this when I have to officiate, unfortunately, at memorials. And I have one right away at 2 o'clock in, back in Teaneck. So, unfortunately, I won't be able to join you for lunch, which I really enjoy doing. But that really comes first. So, uh, I need to be on my way. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about something that I think is very important. And it has to do with the conflict, I should say up front, between uh, individualism on the one hand, and many of us are staunch individualists, and what indeed we owe to others, okay, in terms of our social relations. There's always a tension there. And, you know, through life, I, I work continually work out my position on this tension, and I think it really shapes who we are and ultimately shapes the nature of the society that we live in. We sense, I think, that American society is in distress in the current era. There's a range of social ills which, in my view, bear something in common with each other. I think we're all struck by the extraordinary increase in what are sometimes referred to as, quote, deaths of despair, end quote. The suicide rate has gone up significantly in the past two decades, perhaps most poignantly among teenagers. Death from opioid addiction has reached truly alarming proportions. So the point that the average, to the point that the average life expectancy for the first time in American history has actually declined as a result of the extraordinary number of people who are dying of opioid addiction and overdosing. We all shudder at the perpetuation of violence and mass killings that is at a level with no global equivalent outside of war zones. Although it is more difficult to quantify, increasing numbers of Americans report uh, feelings of loneliness, so much so that a recent article in Psychology Today referred to this phenomenon as an epidemic. Depression is surging among Americans. 
and commensurate with loneliness, depression, and despair, there's been a documented decrease in the number of people involved in civic associations, be it unions, clubs, educational organizations, neighborhood groups, and churches as well. Americans are increasingly alone. Atheists may employ the decline in church affiliation, which now exceeds 25% of the American population, but on a social level, I am not willing to concede that this is altogether a good thing. I include among the issues I wish to add to these phenomena the increasing privatization of American life, the extraordinary wealth gap that puts tremendous power in the hands of a few individuals, while the laboring classes and the poor suffer the anxieties of falling through the bottom or merely staying afloat with crappy, insecure jobs that leave them alone and isolated while the social safety net becomes increasingly frayed. These realities serve as a backdrop for what I want to discuss this morning, and that is at bottom a philosophical question. Namely, what is the place of the individual in society? And the more expansive question of to whom we as members of society, and moreover as humanists, should feel ourselves accountable. If we are traditional God believers, the answer to this question in an ultimate sense would be obvious. We ultimately would be accountable to the creator, to the supreme being who is the author of the universe and to whom we owe our existence. God is the source of all being, including us, and we live our lives in response to his will, which we know through his word and his commandments. And since for most traditionally religious people, God is the author of morality, when we are acting morally, we are also being accountable to God's will. No doubt for those who are traditionally religious, we are also accountable to other people, perhaps to the community of believers and to all humankind. But in the final analysis, God claims our highest allegiance and all accountability funnels back to the creator. But if our ultimate loyalty is not to God, the situation is somewhat more open-ended. If not God, to whom are we responsible? There are no doubt a good number of responses to this question, which I think is by no means a trivial question. How we answer it in great measure, as noted, shapes the quality of our lives and writ large the nature of our society. How we answer this question stands as the foundation of the kind of society that we want to have and strive politically and otherwise to create. A good place to start, I think, is with the individual and our individual selves. In many ways, the modern world, the modern world is centered on the individual and a commitment to individualism is a much heralded value of our modern life. Beyond that, the United States has always put a great premium on individualism, perhaps more so than any other nation, and it is for many a source of our national identity and our national pride. In answering the question of accountability, if we focus on the American experience, perhaps a compelling response should be that we are accountable to ourselves, to our own welfare, our success, our power, and our happiness, looking out for number one in the colloquial idiom. As an individual, I should be accountable to myself primarily, or maybe if brought to an extreme, myself alone to the exclusion of others. Some historians have argued that people as individuals didn't truly exist in the pre-modern world. If one looks at medieval Europe or traditional societies, people's identities were much more grafted, melded into their communities, usually religious communities, but also clans, tribes, castes, guilds, social classes, and where you were situated on the social hierarchy. Asserting oneself as distinct from others or striving for individual achievement was not especially valued in the pre-modern era and not part of one's sense of self. Embeddedness in group values and sharing their myths and practices is how people lived out their lives. Conformity and performing prescribed duties, as well as obligation to authorities, was assuredly more in evidence than expression of individual freedom, personal striving, achievement, and aggrandizement. This historical interpretation, I think, has been indeed somewhat overstated. We find descriptions of distinct even individual personalities even in the Bible. But I think it is the case that the heavy emphasis placed on individualism, such as we witness in contemporary America, is something that does not really emerge until modern times. 
Somewhere around the 16th century, or maybe a bit earlier, we see evidence of the sketching of individual persons in art, poetry, uh, literature, and then somewhat later, certainly in the domain of political thinking. It is sometimes said that the novel, the novel is a distinctly modern literary form, and it is not coincidental that among the first novels was Robinson Crusoe, which depicts an individual living alone on an island and outside of society. Robinson Crusoe could not be written in the 12th century. It had to await a type of modern consciousness in a modern society before something like that, could, that idea could be crafted in fictional form. But focusing on the individual, and his or her interests is a good place to start for uh, obvious reasons. Each individual is the center of his or her own, her own life experience. It is we who experience and interpret our world. When pain is inflicted on us, it is we as individuals who suffer it. It is our own subjective individual experience that makes all the difference. And it is our own individual lives, with perhaps a few extraordinary exceptions, that we value more than anything else. We may be exceptionally rich, powerful, and popular. We may win honor and fame directed upon us by other people. We may be objectively extolled as being a great person and have everything in the world going for us. But if for whatever reasons, we psychologically feel ourselves to be unhappy, miserable, and worthless, that subjective individual sense of ourselves trumps all other validation we receive coming from the external world. Our individual selves are the seed of our experience, and we are fated to live out our lives from the inside out, so to speak. And if we are miserable, how the world beyond us evaluates us makes little or no difference in the final analysis to us. And of course, our death will be ours and ours alone, which is a thought that often sits uncomfortably. But to my way of thinking, we can think of individualism and our individual self, in fact, in two ways. Individualism, as I've come to understand it, has two employments, so to speak. One way is political, and the other way is social. In other words, the individualism, the individual and individualism is a twofold concept. I've got to explain what I mean. Let me begin with a political formulation of the individual. I think that appreciation for the importance of subjectivity in the 17th and 18th centuries gave rise to a growing appreciation of the importance of the individual, individualism as a way of understanding the place of the person in society, and to a philosophy of individual rights, which became the basis of modern democracy. A historian by the name of Lynn Hunt, who teaches out in California, has a very interesting thesis in this regard. She thinks one of the factors that gave rise to the appreciation of the individual emerged primarily in France, when, the upper, cla when upper class women and men developed a widespread interest in reading novels which dealt with the lives, including the inner lives, of people much different from themselves, such as paupers, young girls, and foreigners, what she called the epistolary novel, which flourished in the late 18th century in France and elsewhere. For the first time, people became acquainted through reading such novels with the humanity of others. And this spurred an appreciation for their lives, their subjectivity, and their personalities as individuals. This, in turn, gave rise to the idea that individuals possess rights as individuals, what today we call human rights. This idea is of the greatest importance. In modern political philosophy, it is the individual who is the possessor of rights. The individual is the rights holder. What this means, most of all, is that the individual person is protected from and is immune to control, oppression, coercion, and violation of, by others, especially the state and its government, whose power compared to the individual is overwhelmingly great. For Lynn Hunt, the paradigmatic human right is the freedom and protection of the individual from being tortured, from being tortured, especially by the state. And historically, this is very interesting, as she documents. Up until the middle of the 18th century in France, torture was an established and totally accepted practice in the French judicial system. If the state thought 
so, excuse me, if the state sought a, a confession from a suspect, it was a routine and accepted practice to torture him on the grounds that the body in pain could not lie. But within a short span of about tw only 20 years, sensibilities changed and thinking about this totally flipped with the result that torture was banished from the French judicial system. There were other influences. If you're Italian, you can be very proud of sort of the luminary of the Italian Enlightenment, a man by the name of Cesare Beccaria. Okay, Beccaria wrote a path-breaking book in the late 18th century, very influential among the philosophes of the Enlightenment, including Americans like Jefferson and, uh, and Franklin and so forth. It was called On Crimes and Punishments, in which he made very compelling, a very compelling case for the, for the abolition of both torture and in the 18th century, the abolition of the death penalty, okay? And it's because of the writing of Beccaria, okay, and his influence that we have an Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that forbids cruel and unusual punishment. If, they, if the, the Bill of Rights were written 60 years earlier, that would probably not appear in it. But there was a massive shift in thinking with an understanding, again, of the subjectivity and humanity of human beings that led to that change. Okay, also in addition, in his early, the great luminary of the French Enlightenment was Voltaire. And earlier in his career, he totally supported torture as part, as part of French jurisprudence. Towards the end of his life, he condemned it, okay? There was a flip in regard to human consciousness in that regard. It's for that reason, as I said, that we have an Eighth Amendment to our Bill of Rights, which protects us. To put this concept into positive terms, the idea of the individual that goes along with the individual possessing rights is that the individual is a free, autonomous agent who possesses the liberty to direct her or his life as he or she pleases. Each person possesses freedom and agency, uncoerced by the state, by others, or by society. And in this freedom is vested the person's dignity. As the 19th century philosopher of liberty, John Stuart Mill so nicely put it, quote, he said, quote, each man should be free to pursue his own plan of life, okay? It's up to us to basically build our own plan of life. That's a nice phrase. What this implies is that rather than being absorbed in, into society, the individual in her freedom stands somewhat apart from society, outside of society, and has the freedom and agency, as Spinoza stated at the dawn of the modern era, quote, to think what he wants and do what he thinks. That's a lovely phrase. A person should be basically think what he wants, okay, and do what he thinks. That's a very modern concept that becomes the basis of modern democratic, modern democratic thinking. These ideas, needless to say, need to be cherished, upheld, and defended with the greatest militancy. Because it is this idea of the individual and individual rights in which our freedom and democracy rest, as well as a commitment to equality. It is the basis of our civil liberties. If we lose this defense of the individual in the political sense, then we are simply paving the way for oppression and tyranny. Okay, this idea is absolutely fundamental to our freedom. Perhaps no society, no na nation has appropriated this modern invention of individualism and taken it to greater extremes than the United States. It lies at the heart of the American spirit and presupposes a particular way of life that implies a whole set of values. But there are, der but there are derivative values that uh, can devolve from this understanding of the individual and his or her relationship to society that begin to shade into what I refer to as the social appreciation or employment of individualism. Some which, especially if brought to an extreme, may conflict with our very important, with other very important values and indeed may not be so attractive. Let me give some examples. The idea of the individual does imply to varying degrees that the individual person stands again outside of society and in a certain sense stands against society. This can be construed as a zero-sum game. What society gains comes at the expense of the individual and what the individual gains comes at the expense of society. Such a notion of the individual can imply that I am totally sovereign over my own life and can do as I please with it as long as I'm not hurting anybody else. In short, my sole allegiance is to myself, 
and, take, and if taken to an extreme, I owe nothing to society or to anyone else. This concept of the individual is the basis of what we often refer to as libertarianism. Okay, libertarianism. I suspect in many of its applications, people such as ourselves support a libertarian view of the individual. When it comes again, for example, when it comes to the heated issue of, of abortion, I suspect many advocates of a woman's right to choose would adopt the position that a woman's body belongs to her individual self alone and not to society, not the state, and not to the fetus. Many would support the law, uh, to give another example, just enacted, I'm happy to say, because I was a strong supporter, uh, many would support the law just enacted in my own New Jersey, which allows for physician-assisted suicide under certain stringent conditions. New Jersey has now become the eighth state to allow you to end your life voluntarily if you meet certain, certain criteria. At bottom, the right to suicide is based on the notion that the individual's life and her choice to end it belongs to the individual alone and not to society, the state, her family, or to God. Likewise, we would invoke individual rights when it comes to speech, with few exceptions, to religious conscience, to be free of slavery or torture, and to a range of other immunities that individuals hold, the individual holds against society and the state. Here, many of us would concur with the libertarian position rooted in a stark and absolute or almost absolute sense of individualism. As a matter of rights, the person is accountable only to himself or herself. But I suspect that when it comes to issues pertaining to the economy, we very same people begin to have a lot of problems with the unfettered sovereign individual whose only allegiance or accountability is primarily or only to oneself. We know through painful experience where this application of individualism lies as it pertains to the market. It leads inevitably to a privileged few becoming extraordinarily wealthy and powerful while the vast majority grow increasingly impoverished. Free market laissez-faire capitalism which places individualism at its center is a very powerful engine in creating great wealth, but it inevitably kills around the edges. Okay. This reality opens the door to what I'm referring to as individualism in a social sense. While we need to defend individualism as a basis for political rights as militantly as we can, individualism in the social sense what I would call radical individualism is very, okay, problematic. True, true enough, America often glorifies the individual. The classic case is the icon of the stoic cowboy who rides alone and often engages in historic adventures. Or Americans often point with pride to the American genius, creativity, and inventiveness that emerges from the freedom vested in individuals to pursue their dreams and their visions. Although I would contend that this praise of individual creativity is often based in a fiction in the sense that American individual accomplishment often rests on social contributions made by others and springs from the social soil in which the individual is rooted. He wasn't an American, he was an Englishman, but Isaac Newton had a beautiful phrase where he says, if I've been able to see a little further than other men, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. I love that phrase. It's a beautiful metaphor, okay, and so forth. But we don't have to go to England. We can turn to our own Barack Obama, okay, who I believe is somewhat of a communitarian, and that's where, if you're smart, you can see that's where I'm going to lead, okay. Barack Obama pointed out this fiction of the individual creative American accomplishment when he was running for the presidency the first time around and he made a speech which, which got him into trouble with the business class because they drew the conclusion that he was making a statement which was anti-business. He wasn't doing that. He was trying to make a philosophical statement about the nature of American society and American achievement and he said the following in his race back all the way back then. He said there is nobody in this country who got rich on his own. Nobody. You built a factory out there, good for you. 
But I want to be clear, you moved your goods to market on the roads that the rest of us paid for. You hired workers the rest of us paid to educate. You were safe in your factory because of police forces and fire forces that the rest of us pay for. You didn't have to worry that marauding bands would come and seize everything at your factory and hire someone to protect against this because of the work of the rest of, the rest of us did. Now look, you built a factory and it turned into something terrific or a great idea. God bless. Keep a big hunk of it. But part of the underlying social contract is you take a hunk of that and pay forward to the next kid who comes along. Beautiful phrase, right? It got him into trouble, but he think, I think he's absolutely right. Okay. But the negative side of radical individualism becomes clear by invoking several extreme cases. If I am a radical individualist and thereby feel that I am accountable to no one but myself, Okay, no one but myself. This might lead to a situation, for example, in which I'm walking along, see a small child drowning in a shallow pool, and do absolutely nothing to save him or her on the grounds that we are all individuals who owe nothing to anyone but ourselves. And if I walk on by and do nothing, so be it. In a legal sense, I may be within my rights in that there is no law that forces me to be a good Samaritan. But in a moral sense, I think we would all conclude that such a person was morally deficient and depraved to let a child drown because he felt no accountability to the welfare of the child or because he just had his pants dry cleaned and didn't want to get them wet. Okay, so that would be morally very problematic. Individualism seen from this perspective concludes that we are individuals totally separate from other human beings. We are, total, we are exclusively responsible only to and for ourselves alone, and we, sur we survive or thrive based on individual power, privilege, luck, and perhaps our cunning, aggression, ruthlessness, comp competitive instincts, and unbridled egotism. Such radical individualism portrays the individual person as standing alone in a world and society which are essentially hostile and combative. What the t philosopher Thomas Hobbes referred to as, quote, a war of each against all. Moreover, it is also a formula, I think, for isolation and loneliness. Raise this portrayal to the level of society, and in my view, we get to see where America in the current era is ominously moving. It is a philosophy of the individual in society which I personally reject, even as I defend the rights of the individual in a political sense. I hope I'm making this clear. It's nuanced and complex. There's rights in a political sense, individualism in a political sense, and individualism as a social philosophy that states a broader commitment. Okay? Rather, I see the individual, personally speaking, I see the individual as not standing alone, but deeply embedded in social environments, in families, in communities, both those into which we are born and those which are created and those that are identified with those institutional frameworks which are part and parcel of society, such as the workplace, schools, and other organizations which are part, which are part of or we choose, which we're part of or choose to join. In short, we live in a web of social relations, and we are profoundly dependent on other people and society as a whole, including those generations that came before us. Examples of this dependence are endless. No individual, think about it, and we never do, no individual in this room had to invent the language that he or she speaks. Okay, It was handed down to us as an endowment, we might even say a gift, from the linguistic culture into which we were born. We are proud of the values we hold and espouse and cherish them as a product of our experience, our intelligence, and our original thinking. But this conclusion, I think, in great measure, is a product of blind egoism. The Apple friends, you get older, you begin to realize this with a bit of regret. The apple really doesn't fall very far from the tree. <laughs> and the values we hold are greatly molded by the culture we inhabit, the family that we were born into, and the values that we are exposed to through life. If we were born, just think about it, it doesn't have to be genius to come to this realization. If you were born into a different culture and a different time and place, you would think very differently and have very different values. You would be a different person. It's a matter of luck and contingency that you happen to be born 
are and in the place and culture you were, and that culture molds, essentially molds who you become. Socially speaking, I think our individual selves are like the tip, very tip of the iceberg. Beneath the surface is the funded endowments of society we receive and rest upon. And what is distinct to us as individuals is for the most part taking what comes from others and perhaps rearranging it in somewhat distinctive ways. Much of who we are is an internalization of the gifts of others. We are individuals, yes, but we are also very much social creatures at the same time, biologically, culturally, psychologically, and in many other ways. That which is individually unique to us, I think is to be highly cherished and respected, but I would argue it constitutes but a small fraction, fraction of what makes us up. As the poet John Donne famously remarked, no man is an island, and I believe this is pervasively true. Rather than see the individual as separate from society, I would argue in a social sense that without community, without others, there simply cannot be an individual. It is my view that our individuality, in fact, is forged out of our active engagement with others and active engagement with communities. Becoming who we are is a dynamic and very social process and activity. Likewise, I would argue that while in the political sense the individual is free, in a social sense, there simply cannot be any freedom outside of society and the conditions within which the person lives out his or her life. Being free has a great deal to do with my ability, in fact, to exercise my potentials and capabilities. But if society has relegated me to abject poverty or deprives me of an education, my freedom is greatly curtailed. My freedom exists within society and not aloof or independent from it. When it comes to the question of to whom I am responsible, to whom I am accountable, I would argue that by virtue of our social natures, just as we inhabit a web of social relations, so we morally inhabit a web of moral obligation. I believe in what the Harvard political philosopher Michael Sandel refers to as, quote, the encumbered, the encumbered self. I believe in what I would refer to as associative obligations. In other words, every relationship I inhabit comes with incumbent duties to others. Parents have obligations to their children, children to their parents. Employers to their employees, employees to their employers and co-workers. Friends to friends, government to the citizens, its citizens and citizens to their government. And in the widest circle, human beings to human beings, both known to us and to strangers. And even beyond the human realm, especially urgent in our times, I believe we have a responsibility to nature and the natural environment which has given us life, sustains us, and on which we are dependent. This may take us indeed into dabbling with a spiritual sensibility of sorts, but I don't think this is necessarily objectionable. In fact, it may be quite a nice and uplifting thing. You know, when it comes to environmental ethics, there are two reasons for supporting the environment that can be given ethically. One is totally self-interested. In other words, we're dependent on the natural world, and if we want to survive as a human species, we have to protect it, okay, in order to survive. Or you could take what I would say would be a more sublime and perhaps spiritualized view that nature itself independently makes a claim on us, okay, to which we can respond. That's a more sort of, quote, modern and spiritualized way, and I gotta tell you, I don't see that as particularly objectionable. I live in a home with a, where my backyard is a primeval forest, huge trees going back 250 years. And one thing we know is that trees are responsive to their environment. Now, I'm not making the claim they have secret lives and they have brains and they, you know, they're self-conscious and so on, but they are responsive. And just as myself, trees are living things. I share with them, okay? A, a, a sense of life, okay, can't say sense of life, but I share with them the condition of life. And therefore, I gotta tell you, I'm drawn to that. I mean, you may feel that's a little squishy and, you know, new agey and so on, you can throw it away if you want. But, you know, there's a nice sensibility, a type of respect I have. Do you know what I'm saying? For the trees in my backyard, and I feel a need to protect them. I love them. Uh, I like to be with them every morning. 
yeah, I'm reading the New York Times and my coffee in my backyard, but I'm also communing with the trees, and it's, it's a nice thing. So the point is, one can even claim that nature, we have an obligation to nature because nature makes a claim on us, either because we want to survive and we need nature to en enable our survival, or because nature independently, again, in a more spiritualized sense, makes a claim on us. Either way, it works, okay, and so on. Before concluding, I want to take this notion of social obligation one step further even beyond the bounds of classical liberal thought. Okay. Here we drill down even deeper. The political idea of individualism and individual rights contains within it the central idea of freedom. The individual, again, is a free agent, agent, and this bears on the notion of responsibility. Most of us would conclude that a person can only be responsible for acts or behaviors that he himself has chosen to undertake and has consented to. It seems morally wrong, indeed very wrong, to hold a person at all responsible for acts which he has not himself done or which, or which were, was done, were done by someone else. Indeed, all of us, I think, would strenuously protest if we were held responsible for something that we did not do, okay? This conclusion follows directly from the idea of the human person as an individual. But if we conclude, as I do, that we are social beings, and much of who we are is the inheritance we've received from others, maybe this conclusion, as clear as it seems to the liberal mind, is not quite so certain. Indeed, one of the great moral and political issues that confronts us at this moment raises this very question of where to draw the lines of responsibility. And that question is illuminated by the reality that we are all products of particular communities, again, which shape us, with whom we share common values, and we partake in common narratives that mold our identities. And to the extent that they do, they may justifiably claim our loyalty. Let me give the starkest example of where I'm leading. Assuredly, the most intimate community, so to speak, that claims our loyalty is our family. It is important to note that families are communities that we did not consent to belong to. Nobody asked to be born into a particular family. It's just an existential given. It's a fact, okay? It's a function of fate, if you want to put it that way. You didn't ask to be born. There's no consent involved in that. Let's assume, okay, let's return to drowning children again and make good examples. Let's assume I come upon two drowning children and one of them is my own child, and the other is a child of a stranger, okay? But I can physically save only one of them. Okay? Few people would argue that I should respond on the basis of a dispassionate commitment to fairness and liberal values and flip a coin to decide which child I will save. That will be very fair, okay? okay. And a very good, fairness is a good liberal value we all want to live by, right? But few would find fault with my choosing to save my own child, recognizing that parents have a special bond of loyalty to their children that they do not have to others. Or looking at the other, looking generationally in the other direction, one might conclude that I, I am responsible to care for my aging parent and not any parent, even though consent cannot fully justify why this is so. I certainly, again, didn't choose my parents. In other words, we can be responsible for things for which our choice was not at issue, in this case being the child of a particular parent. The fact that my consent was not involved, however, does not free me from being responsible. One might argue, perhaps, that in taking care of that parent, I'm in effect giving back what was earlier given to me by my parent. But the counter-argument here is that even if my parent was unkind or neglectful to me as a child, my responsibility to my mother or my father still pertains by virtue of the loyalty that is inherent in the family bond, a loyalty and bond which transcends the issue of voluntary choice. Am I making clear this point? Okay, I hope I'm being clear about it. Now let's broaden the community of the loyalty that ostensibly goes with it from the family, let's broaden it from the family to the nation. 
These loyalties and the narratives and the incumbent responsibilities they entail that emerge from communities I belong to may even extend across generations. Let's look at the responsibility that the citizens of a nation have to historical injustices. One can ask the question, especially at a time when we painfully see a reemergence of right-wing nationalism and anti-Semitism in Germany, as to whether German citizens today bear responsibility to the Jewish population in their midst for the perpetration of the Holocaust and the systematic murder of six million Jews, even though those atrocities were committed before contemporary Germans were born. Okay. Today, the Jewish population of Germany has now risen to about 200,000, many of them coming from the former Soviet Union. And ironically, some of them are expatriates from Israel who've actually moved to Germany, which is quite a historical irony. But that's a other question. The question is, do Germans today have responsibility okay, in that regard? Moral individualists would say no. Those who played no role in the Holocaust and themselves did not commit those crimes have no responsibility at all for what they, they themselves did not do. And this response does have, admittedly, philosophically, does have some compelling character. You can make that argument and make it rather, rather powerfully. But I'm not so sure that the answer is clear. This position of moral individualism presupposes that the self is detachable from the community from which the person derives his identity. The Germans of today share a common culture, a common historical lineage, and therefore in some way a solidarity with their German ancestors who did perpetrate those atrocities. The Germans of today are embedded in a continuous German narrative, so to speak. They certainly cannot be blamed for the acts themselves, but that, that does not mean that as a part of the German people and, the, and inheritors of the past, they have no responsibility for the way in which they relate to Jews in Germany today. To be blamed and be responsible are not the same thing. They are different. To disavow any moral responsibility at all seems to me, speaking for myself, to be morally just too thin, just too thin. Well, you may see where this is going, and I'm bringing this talk to a close. You may see where this is going. In the American context, the issue of reparations for the African American community, which endured 400 years of slavery and institutionalized racism, is not new, but it has emerged again as a matter of contemporary debate. It is again certainly on the agenda, and behind it is the same dilemma about accountability. In 2008, in my own New Jersey, the legislature debated whether it should issue a formal apology for slavery, and a Republican assemblyman asked, quote, who living today is guilty of slaveholding and thus capable of apologizing for the offense, end quote. He obviously thought no one saying, quote, today's residents of New Jersey, even those who can trace their ancestry back to slaveholders, bear no collective guilt or responsibility for unjust events in which they personally played no role. Okay, end quote. This again is the position of moral individualism, but in my opinion, it is problematic. The injustices which are the legacies of slavery continue, they go on, and the white population of this society continues to reap the benefits which 400 years of oppressing and plundering the black population of America have brought. It is not for the people of Thailand or Italy or Turkey to apologize for the slavery of African Americans or to work out a program for reparations. It is not their history. It is not their narrative. But it is ours. And it feels irresponsible for Americans of today to detach themselves from that history and its tragic legacy. We are not to be blamed for acts we did not commit. But that does not mean that we today do not bear some responsibility for what our fellow Americans of the past perpetrated. Again, we share a common narrative, a living historical legacy, and as a nation, a common community across time. In closing, I want to return to what is the guiding question of this exploration, which is really the question, is it about me or is it about us? Certainly as individuals, we need to look after ourselves and our own welfare, the realization of our potentials, our aspirations, and our dreams. There is no virtue in selling ourselves short or in self-denial, and as my late colleague Matthew E. Spetter said, a person should never hold himself cheaply. 
And we all have a right, of course, to defend our liberty, pursue our happiness, and assert ourselves in the world. Yes, we do. But in some sense, the question and the dichotomy it suggests is a false one. It is my view that we are for ourselves when we are for others. It is my view that we become our best selves by committing ourselves to higher dedications, to people and purposes beyond our immediate individual self-interest. Our society, I have long believed, has suffered from an excess of pursuits focused disproportionately on the magnification of the individual self, whether it be an obsession with materialism, wealth, consumerism, personal power, public acclaim and aggrandizement, much of which has led us down the road to loneliness and for too many despair. And our society, spurred by a reprehensible wealth gap, suffers from the socially destructive momentum of privatization. The wealthy can separate themselves from the rest of us through private schools, private security services, private clubs, private transportation when they own three cars, and live behind private walls in gated communities, all of which ensures that public institutions erode and people living different lives never encounter each other. This eviscerates, I think, a sense of common community and peoplehood and destroys the matrix in which civic virtue is nurtured. In short, it helps to hasten the demise of democracy. Therefore, what's needed, I believe, friends, is an uplifting effort that will take to heart the humanity of the other and a vision that on this small planet, we all share a common destiny and that we need to dedicate ourselves as best we can, however we can, to the common good. That's it, folks.